My name is Keely Crowley, and I am the PREA Grant Coordinator with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections, uh, and here to talk to you today about the Prison Rape Elimination Act. I wanted to thank WACASA for the invitation to participate and for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about this really important issue. I also want to thank the audience for their interest in, in PRE and taking the time to, to be with us today. As I said, my name is Keely Crowley. I am the PREA Grant Coordinator for Department of Corrections, and I've been in this role for about a year. Prior to that, I worked in the Victim Services Office with Corrections. Uh, coming up on about four years that I've been with the department, and prior to that, I was the director of a sexual assault program in the community. So I um, have a long history with WACASA, and like I said, very glad to, to be a part of this, this effort today. A brief overview of what we're going to be uh, looking at today. We're going to talk a little bit um, about just the overall uh, issue of, of sexual assault and detention. We're going to talk a little bit about the history and intent of PREA, some sexual abuse dynamics and detention, the PREA standards, and then also resources that are available to advocates and others in the community who would like to learn more about PREA. The issue uh, with the content warning, I do just want to let people be aware that briefly we're going to be watching um, a, s a short clip with some survivor testimony, so just want you to be prepared for that. And certainly, I know sometimes talking about the issue of sexual assault and sexual abuse in general can be a little uh, overwhelming, so please do what you need to do to take care of yourself throughout the webinar. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send them to Peter, and as he said, we'll address them as we can. So we're going to start out with a quick clip that is provided by Just Detention International. I think it gives us a good foundation as we proceed through the rest of the webinar and the topics that we're going to be covering to actually hear from some survivors. So um, please take a moment to uh, join us and listen to their stories. So the issue of sexual abuse, I know there are a lot of advocates on the line and a lot of people who in other disciplines uh, have a great knowledge of sexual assault in the community. So some of this is going to be a review, but want to put it out there that, you know, often when we're talking about sexual abuse in the community, we know the statistics. We know that one in four women and one in six men are reporting victimization by the time they're 18 um, years old of that sexual abuse. When we look at sexual abuse or sexual assault and detention, the numbers that we're seeing are pretty staggering in and of themselves. Statistics provided by the United States Bureau of Justice Statistics National Inmate Survey that was conducted from 2011-2012 tell us that in the past 12 months when asking inmates or if they haven't been in the facility for a full 12 months, what the rate of victimization uh, is, and we have found from this survey that an estimated 4% of state and federal prison inmates and 3.2% of jail inmates reported experiencing one or more incidents of sexual victimization by another inmate or facility staff. Taking that down to the youth population, an estimated 9.5% of adjudicated youth in state facilities are reporting experiencing one or more incidents of sexual victimization by another youth or staff. And granted, those numbers aren't as high as the percentages that are being reported in the community, but when you think specifically numbers for Wisconsin Department of Corrections in our Division of Adult Institutions, we have approximately 21,000, 22,000 inmates. So you start looking at that number of percentages when we peel it back and really look at the number of victims that we're talking about, that's hundreds and hundreds of survivors just in that correctional system. If we expand that to the number of individuals that are coming through county jails, that's even more. Um, and similar to in the community, what we know about sexual assault in detention is that it's underreported as well. So um, the numbers that are out there are, are significant, and that's why for somebody who works uh, with PREA each and every day, knowing that you have the interest and you're here to learn more about it and how you can help um, is really encouraging. Just a little background about PREA. Uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was signed into law in September of 2003 by President George W. Bush, and that was actually uh, after receiving unanimous bipartisan support from the United States Congress that that legislation proceeded. It is the first United States uh, federal law that was passed dealing with the sexual assault of prisoners. 
After uh, PREA was signed into law, it was uh, established a PREA commission to review and draft some standards that were finally released in 2012 and made effective in the Federal Register. Now these standards are for all confinement facilities including uh, prisons and jails which are included in the same standard together, police municipal lockups, residential community confinement facilities, and also juvenile facilities. In addition to the standards that came out for these confinement facilities, uh, not that long ago, within the past few months, the Department of uh, Homeland Security also released PREA standards for U.S. immigration facilities. With the PREA standards, I know there's been some questions about there about, you know, what who is required to comply with PREA and is it a law, is it a regulation. Um, the standards for, you know, county jails, for police lockups, residential community confinement facilities and the juvenile facilities are recommendations that people who are in charge of the leadership of those organizations can decide whether or not they're going to try and implement those standards in their facilities. However, for the Bureau of Federal Prisons and State Prisons, it is a requirement Requirement. The Bureau of Federal Prisons are required to comply with the PREA standards as are state-run facilities. Um, however, if the states choose that they are not going to uh, work towards compliance, and that may be a decision for a variety of reasons, uh, they do face a 5% penalty uh, in some of the grant funding that they do receive from the federal government. So there is a little bit of uh, a financial incentive, but what we really hope is that people are going to look at the standards and want to implement them and work towards compliance because they are the right thing to do for the institution and the population that they serve. The intent of the standards are, are pretty basic, looking at what we want to say is, you know what, we want to make sure that facilities have a zero tolerance standard. Not just a zero tolerance policy, but a zero tolerance for any kind of sexual abuse, sexual harassment, or staff sexual misconduct in their facility. And I want to preface and say that in the community we often refer uh, to adult victimization as sexual assault. In detention, we refer to it as sexual abuse. And as the standards, if you look at the PREA standards, they refer to it as sexual abuse. It really is pretty interchangeable, but I guess just a difference uh, in the vernacular that is used. So if I if I transition back and forth between assault and abuse, please recognize that I'm referring to the um, the same issue. I also want to say that there's difference uh, in referring to different terms for the different populations um, depending on the facility that you're referring to. So if you're referring to a prison or a jail, they will often refer to the population that they incarcerate as inmates. Uh, if you're referring to a juvenile detention facility, they will often refer to their population as residents. If you are talking about community corrections or probation and parole, they will refer to their population as offenders. And if you're talking about a municipal police lockup, they will refer to their population as detainees. Um, so please know again that those can be interchangeable as we continue with our discussion. For the zero tolerance that PREA wants to see implemented in facilities, they want to give the tools uh, with the standards that say, you know what, for that zero tolerance, we want to help you implement measures that will help you prevent, detect, and respond. Uh, I think that's very parallel to the community. Obviously, when we deal with sexual assault in the community, first and foremost, if we can prevent it, obviously that's best and that's ideal. But if we can't prevent it, we want to make sure that we can detect and respond so that we can hold a perpetrator accountable, but more importantly, that we can get victims the services that they would need. Also, the intent of the standards wants to change, I guess, the corrections culture a little bit. Um, and with all due respect to the corrections culture, you know, make it a, an, an environment that is safe for an inmate uh, to come forward and report if they have been victimized. Make it safe for staff who might be concerned about potential victimization to come forward and really encourage uh, not only those reporting to happen, but also to have the tools and the resources to be able to respond appropriately to that report. The types of abuse that are addressed in all of the standards, any different, you know, any of the four different versions are inmate on inmate sexual abuse, inmate on inmate sexual harassment, 
as well as staff on inmate sexual misconduct and staff on inmate sexual harassment. The standards do a really good job of um, giving a definition an extensive definition of when they refer to inmate on inmate sexual abuse, what are they referring to? When they refer to staff on inmate sexual misconduct, what are they referring to? Including in those definitions uh, for the staff on inmate abuse, which I think might be new for some folks, is the definition and the concept of voyeurism and how that can play into the detention environment and potential victimization. For us going forward, I guess if we could just kind of agree on a topic, like I said, I know there's a tremendous amount of experience and expertise of people that are participating in the webinar today, but just so I guess we're all on the same page, recognizing that sexual abuse can be defined as any involuntary sexual act in which a person is threatened, coerced, or forced to engage in against their will, or any sexual touching of a person who is not consented. A core concept that I think is important that we understand um, is when we talk about sexual abuse, we need to recognize that it's not about sex or it's not completely about sex, that there's the motivation behind it um, and the intent behind it involves is a lot more behaviors. It's about coercion, fear, threats, Power, control, manipulation, dominance, grooming, and currency. And those intent, those behaviors often use sex or the sexual abuse as their weapon, but the motive behind it are some very unhealthy behaviors. And we see this demonstrated, I think we all would agree, in the community, but also in detention. Certainly, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about grooming. I think probably the most common um, thing when we talk about grooming, we think about children and we think about pedophiles and perpetrators who um, groom their victims. That is definitely something that we see with sexual assault in detention. But a new kind of conversation for me that I had to learn about since my days um, with a sexual assault program was the concept of currency. And I think we're starting to be able to talk about that in the community a lot more now because organizations such as WACASA are uh, educating us a lot more about the human trafficking issue and how that plays out in our communities. But certainly in detention, seeing uh, sexual favors or people used as currency to pay for sexual favors um, or to pay for protection uh, is definitely something that we are becoming more and more aware of the more we learn about it and the more we pay attention to it. Um, one of the things I want to do the next, um, like I said, I think everybody's probably just super eager to do a little bit of a pop quiz, but we want to know that you're all out there and still hanging with us and, and um, engaged. Let's just put it out there. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of a pop quiz that I think is uh, helps lay a little bit of a foundation for you to keep in mind as we go forward um, with the rest of the conversation um, <clears throat> and talking about some additional dynamics. So just please keep things in mind as we continue with our discussion. So the first question, we're just going to ask you some true or false. Um, true or false, non-consensual sex is a sexual assault. And we're just going to give it another second to see what, what the results were. It looks like the majority of you are saying it's true. You're right on. The most are absolutely to remember that non-consensual sex is a sexual assault. That issue of consent is huge. Um, so please remember that as we go. The next question. True or false, compliance is the same as consent. Looks like we've got a phenomenal 100% reporting to say that that is false. Compliance is not the same as consent. 
And we just got a big high five from the WACASA staff that know they're doing a good job when they relay that message. Flip through here. Third question, true or false, it's okay for correctional staff to have sexual contact with an inmate as long as the inmate consents. And it looks like you guys are spot on again with knowing that it is not okay for staff, uh, correctional staff, to have contact with inmates as long as the inmate consents. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just, I'm sure I have it somewhere else in my presentation, but just so I don't forget to um, say it, in the state of Wisconsin, for correctional staff to have sexual contact with an inmate or an offender is considered a second degree sexual assault a Class H felony punishable by up to 40 years in prison or a $100,000 fine. Um, so absolutely is not okay. Fourth and final question, true or false, inmates can have consensual sex in Wisconsin correctional facilities. And that is false. Uh, for most correctional facilities, I can speak with uh, absolute knowledge for the Department of Corrections that that is false, uh, and from any other county jail that I have heard from or talked with, that is false as well, that it is not, uh, not allowed. So those are just, like I said, some things to think about um, when you're thinking about the issue of sexual abuse and detention. I actually think we're going to keep you uh, hopefully interactive here a little bit more that we want to hear, like I said, I know there's a tremendous amount um, of expertise out there. So if you could share with us in your chat box, one of the things that we're looking and saying, you know, okay, you said, Keely, you said that sexual abuse in the community, you said that sexual abuse and detention is, is very underreported, but why is that? So if you could type in your chat box some reasons, some examples of why you think that uh, inmates, victims, and or victims in the community, why don't they come forward and report um, that they have been victimized? Take a couple seconds for people to be able to share with us. So a lot of great answers coming in that people are saying that victims might be afraid. Uh, they might be afraid of that they're going to be blamed or not believed, afraid of retaliation, uh, fear of, again, the victim blaming, they're scared, fear of mistreatment, uh, they're ashamed, past experiences with oppression, absolutely. You guys are nailing up and have some really great answers there. Um, that are very true and very legitimate reasons that we hear from survivors that they may not be coming forward. Like I said, I think you guys got a lot of them. They may be embarrassed. They may feel shame. They may feel guilty about maybe some of the um, circumstances surrounding the assault and that victim blaming, that people question what a victim was wearing, how they were acting, where they were, who they were with. Um, we've all heard that, and we've heard it some pretty uh, – exaggerated extent of what victims are hearing. They may feel some fear, absolutely. They may feel some responsibility for it, absolutely, that they feel nobody will believe me and everybody will blame me. Um, and those are stigmas out there that I think as advocates, as professionals in the anti-sexual violence movement, um, you know, that we're still trying to correct in our society. And when we look at the anti-sexual violence movement, you know, that's about 30, 40 years old and we're still having to fight those stereotypes. Um, and, and get victims the services that they need. So we look at some other dynamics and think, why don't victims report sexual abuse and detention? The excellent list that you all came up with really can apply to victims in detention as well. They may feel that nobody's going to believe them. Why are they going to think that nobody's going to believe them? Because it's exactly what somebody tells them is, you know what, you're an inmate. You're a liar. You're a criminal. Who's going to believe you? I'm a staff member, you're an inmate. Um, everybody might blame them. They're going to feel that responsibility. A lot of the things that you all had said, um, you know, are going to uh, apply to, to inmates in detention as well. And I think one of the things that's important also to look at is to really kind of think, you know, what are some of our cultural beliefs about sexual abuse and detention? 
and you don't need to change to, to type that in the chat box. You're more than welcome to if you would like to. But just to kind of ask yourself, um, you know, do you hear dialogues about sexual abuse and detention in the community? Are people comfortable talking about it? Are people willing to have a serious conversation about it? I think if we really ask ourselves those questions, the answer is probably no. Not a lot of people are wanting to talk about it or are comfortable talking about it. And sadly, if people are talking about it, it's not a serious conversation. It's a joke. We could probably do the raise, raise your hand feature, but uh, we don't need to. But I think if people talk about, you know, who's all heard the don't drop the soap joke? Um, who's all heard the, um, you know, if you're going to jail, you're going to be somebody's girlfriend, or I hope you meet Bubba when you get there, or some of those things that really have made it, um, made it a joke. And uh, every presentation I give I, afterwards, I always tell myself I'm going to stop using this example, but I can't help myself. I have to uh, share this story because it illustrates still in 2014 what people think when we're talking about sexual abuse and detention. And one of the things, um, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Grudge Match, um, but I saw it a few months ago, I guess it was already. It was still earlier this year, um, and it was a movie about um, two two kind of washed up boxing stars who had really been rivals in their, you know, the high point of their career. And one of the things, uh, they were supposed to have like one final match to see who was the best. And now that they're both retired, they're looking at kind of making some money by having this big blowout, um, high profile boxing match. And the problem is these guys hate each other. So anytime they get together to try and promote this big match, um, they end up fighting. And the first time they're together, they start beating on each other, they get arrested, they get taken to the municipal lockup at the local jail. Um, they thought they, they put them in two, you see them in two cells side by side, and there's other inmates in there, and they're just screaming at each other back and forth. And after a few minutes, one of the characters yells, would somebody just rape him already? And... I remember, you know, I'm hoping I'm in the room here where we are, there's some gasps and some head nods, and I'm hoping that's what everybody is happening when they're listening to. You know, I was just astounded to think that still in 2014 that that was an acceptable form of comedy, that that was acceptable to say, wow, I hope somebody would rape that person, um, you know, that that was, that was acceptable. Um, but when we look at it, like I said, with Priya only being around for about, you know, the official legislation for a little over 10 years, certainly there was some grassroots efforts uh, from survivors and advocates addressing it before then. But we've got a long way to go to catch up um, to sexual abuse in the community to really have these conversations and to really address these stereotypes and really talk about why this is such an important issue for us all to look at. So one of the things with the dynamics that's really important, I think, to recognize is that there are certain populations from their own reports of uh, prevalence that we recognize might be more vulnerable uh, to sexual abuse and detention. Certainly want to identify and acknowledge that it absolutely can happen to anybody, but there are some populations that are more vulnerable. Um, and we're going to give you an example to, uh, or opportunity to share some of the populations in detention that you think might be more vulnerable to sexual abuse. Uh, again, if you could please go ahead and type those uh, in the chat column. I'll give you a few seconds. So some people with answers that are coming in to say definitely people who are small, physically small in size, uh, stature, inmates with disabilities, uh, LGBT inmates, uh, younger inmates, inmates with cognitive disabilities, uh, inmates who are going through a detox without medical care, uh, inmates who may be immigrants, who may be limited English proficiency, inmates that have been abused before. I feel like you guys are reading my PowerPoint already because you are just nailing it and really have a good um, perception of, of inmates that are more vulnerable, absolutely. Um, younger inmates uh, that 
might be, uh, you know, youthful inmates that we have inmates in the state of Wisconsin right now um, who, when there are very significant charges for, for felony crimes that they are facing, we do have 15, 16, 17-year-old youthful inmates in our adult prisons. Those younger inmates are very vulnerable um, to sexual abuse, but it's not just the younger inmates. Some of our more elderly inmates are... Um, subject to abuse as well. Uh, LGBTI community, uh, inmates who are intoxicated or under the influence of drugs, and we will um, likely maybe see this more with inmates coming right off the street into either a, a police lockup or a county jail. Limited English proficiency, previous sexual victimization, inmates who are small in physical stature, inmates who are gender nonconforming, who have a phys physical or developmental disability, uh, inmates with mental health issues, inmates who are inexperienced in custodial settings in the inmate code of conduct, uh, sex offenders. I think it's one thing that's really important to realize is that, you know, some people say, well, just get all the sex offenders and just house them on the same units and then the other inmates don't have to worry about it. That'll just take care of everything. But the reality is the, the sex offenders coming from the community aren't necessarily the ones that are the predatory, sexually abusive inmates in the institutions. They're the ones that are often um, more on the side of victimization. So when we talk there about, um, and what I also want to make sure that I say too about the vulnerability, is it's the perceived vulnerability. Um, not saying that everybody who identifies as one of those categories or might fit into one of those categories is automatically going to be victimized. Um, it's the perception of the person who has the predatory behavior is that they perceive them to be more vulnerable. With uh, the LGBT community that a lot of you had said with that would be um, perhaps more vulnerable, when we're looking at the statistics, the LGBT and gender nonconforming inmates are reporting significantly higher percentage of sexual assault. So understanding uh, LGBTI issues is essential for um, safe housing and classification when we have inmates in detention. While the stats that we referred to at the beginning of the webinar, we talked about how 4% of prison inmates were identifying as survivors and 3.2% of jail inmates. When we look at inmates who identify as LGBTI, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, 12.2% in the prison population are reporting an assault by another inmate and 5.4% by a staff member. So obviously by another inmate, that's significantly higher, 12.2% versus 4% of um, the non-LGBTI community. In county jails, again, 3.2 is the uh, statistic we looked at earlier when it comes to LGBT inmates. That's eight, that jumps to 8.5% uh, assaulted by another inmate and 4.3% by staff. So recognizing that those those inmates are reporting at significantly higher numbers. We really need to understand the dynamics that they're facing. And when we talk about gender nonconforming, we're talking about a person whose appearance or manner does not conform to traditional societal gender expectations. Um, when we refer to somebody who's intersex, we talk, uh, we're referring to a person whose sexual or reproductive anatomy or chromosomal pattern does not seem to fit typical definitions of male or female. Um, and sometimes these intersex medical conditions are referred to as uh, disorders of sex development. In the past, people maybe have referred to intersex individuals as hermaphrodites, um, recognizing that that is not a term that we use anymore, but do acknowledge that this is a medical um, issue and disorder that uh, that is referred to as intersex. Along with that, transgender, and I know this is probably a review for a lot of you, but uh, transgender is a person whose gender identity or their internal sense of feeling of whether or not they're male or female is different from the person's assigned sex at birth. Uh, one of the uh, terminologies that we heard coming out of, of some national pre-efforts was the term SOGI. Um, I'm not heard, sure if people have heard that before or not, but the SOGI refers to the sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression of a person. So um, 
this, you do learn something new every day, as Miss Lynn Johnson just said. The SOGI, um, I will put it out there embarrassingly enough, this term came out or I was taught about it right at the time um, that the Olympics were happening. So SOGI and SOGI um, had me really confused for a little bit, but I'm, um, I'm, re I'm really a fairly smart girl, so that uh, is a little embarrassing that that happened. But uh, sexual orientation, referring to the... Um, who the person is physically, sexually, romantically attracted to, whether that's somebody of the same sex or the opposite sex. Um, gender identity, as we said, kind of who you, um, your internal sense of feeling, whether or not you're male or female. And then your gender expression is how you present uh, to the outside world, if you present in a more feminine way or a more masculine way. Um, I think some people who aren't familiar with uh, Gender expression may just think, well, everybody, you know, if you're female and then you are attracted to males and you feel your gender identity as a female and you should present as a female. Um, and just recognizing with, that's not how it always happens. People have a lot of different um, feelings about their gender identity and their gender expression. And why we really need to look at it when we talk about Priya is if you have somebody possibly uh, who is biologically male, for example, um, but they identify their gender uh, identity is as female and they choose their gender expression as female. Perhaps um, they've had breast implants or they've been taking hormones. Um, they're living their life as a female. They present to the outward world as a female. Um, if they come to corrections or they come to a county jail and we say, no, I'm sorry, you are John Smith, you are a male, we are putting you in a male housing unit that could really uh, put that person at a great risk for sexual abuse and sexual harassment. So for confinement facilities to really look and see what is going to be the safest housing option for transgender uh, inmates is a really, really huge issue uh, that we need to look at. As I talked before, and we talked about the dynamics of sexual abuse and detention and looking at the whole process of grooming, I think it's really important to understand, you know, the concept that I don't think there's anybody who, at least we hope not, anybody that's going to work to say, you know what, I think I'm going to have sexual contact with an inmate today. Um, recognizing that it doesn't just happen overnight, that there's what we like to say a continuum of conduct um, that develops that leads to a sexualized environment. With the PREA standards, um, not only, you know, with the PREA standards, they really formalize the concept, but what we as advocates, what we as community members um, should demand from our correctional facilities um, is that they do absolutely, because it's the right thing, have a zero tolerance for any kind of sexual abuse, sexual harassment, or staff sexual misconduct. The th as you start moving away from that zero tolerance, even little things can start to be a problem. If you have an environment where you're allowing, um, you know, sexual verbalization or sexual gestures, whether it be dirty jokes or, um, you know, double entendres between, you know, staff members to each other or staff with inmates or inmates between each other, that can create a sexualized environment. If you don't sanction that behavior between inmates, if you don't, you know, if inmates um, are calling each other fags or they're calling each other dykes or they're calling each other these pejorative, degrading, sexually degrading, disrespectful names and staff don't stop that behavior and sanction that behavior, it's almost that it's accepted that it's okay for people to talk that way. If staff members are talking that way to inmates and another staff member doesn't address it with that person, it's almost as it's, it's accepted. Um, if staff members are thinking that they're just telling maybe, you know, a, a dirty joke between each other, inmates will hear it. And if they think that's okay, if they think that's acceptable, that's going to be taken to the environment that it is. Um, that's always going to, it's never going to stop there. It's going to start, now there's going to be like, okay, if those dirty jokes, if those names I was calling, if that's okay, um, you know, maybe that escalates into some sexual bullying, uh, into a show of control, into some dominance starting to be exerted, either from staff members or other inmates, onto a particular inmate. Again, if that's not stopped and sanctioned, um, if they don't change that environment, it's just going to continue kind of that slippery slope 
um, towards increased behavior. Now there's maybe going to be some horseplay um, between inmates or horseplay with staff and inmates, which should never, ever, ever happen. Um, there's maybe going to start to be some touching where um, inmates, you know, are starting to touch each other, where staff are starting to touch inmates, which again is not appropriate. Certainly staff will have to touch inmates to, uh, you know, to do searches, to provide medical care, um, but there's examples and in, in instances when staff should not be touching inmates, and if that line starts to be crossed, again, it just keeps going down the continuum. Um, maybe now we're going to see some contraband coming into the institution. We're going to be some see some favors being offered. Um, from staff who are trying, again, to groom inmates to get them to do what they want to do. Once we introduce contraband to the equation, now we're talking about safety and security for that entire facility, um, and that becomes a huge issue. Again, if these behaviors aren't stopped and sanctioned, now we're looking at maybe some unwanted advances. Staff maybe has gone too far. They don't know where to draw the line, and it keeps escalating. Um, now maybe we're seeing some threats or promises being made. Um, we're seeing some coercion, we're seeing some protective pairing where between inmates, um, you know, maybe we have a more dominant inmate that looks at a more, a less dominant inmate that says, you know, you do what I want, you provide me with these favors and I'll keep you safe or I'll um, give you canteen or I'll give you some money but you've got to do this for me. Um, and all these behaviors, like I said, the further and further and further we get, not only are we getting away from the zero tolerance, now we have a sexually abusive environment. And again, once we're to this point, the safety and security not only of those inmates has been compromised, but now the safety and security of the staff and that entire institution. And by virtue of that, our communities have been compromised. So that continuum um, is a really thing that, important thing that we need to be aware of. Um, and make sure that we're holding to that really strict adherence to this, the zero tolerance uh, environment that we created. Like I said, the sexual uh, abuse uh, can manifest the power and control we might be seeing uh, staff who are using their position of authority to victimize inmates uh, or even inmate on inmate. Maybe you have an inmate who is more uh, respected in the institution or has more uh, has a specific job or position that they hold that they try to use um, over other inmates to get them to do things that they want. Um, dominating or intimidating behaviors, denying privileges that say, you know what, either you give me a kiss this morning or I'm not letting you go up for rec time or um, you show me your breasts or I'm not letting you go to your work site today. Um, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, that manipulation and coercion may present by some quid pro quo demands that, you know, you do this for me and I'll do this for you. You, um, you know, you provide oral sex for me today and tomorrow I'll make sure you get some extra time in the shower or, um, you know, I'll offer you favors. You know, there's a, it's, it, incarceration is a very restrictive environment. Um, so by offering favors, um, you know, can really be a way to manipulate somebody into getting them to do what you want them to do. By threatening consequences, again, by threatening one of the um, the video that, that we'll share that we'd hoped to play earlier, one of the survivors talks about, um, you know, that the officer that assaulted her would constantly threat her with a major conduct report. And she relays how she knew when her release date was. And she knew that a major ticket could affect her release date. And she was not going to do anything that was going to jeopardize her release date. So threatening those consequences. Um, the grooming behaviors, again, with horseplay, um, possibly showing preference by offering favors or special privileges, um, sharing your canteen which I think on the surface might look nice to somebody to be, wow, you know, you're a new inmate, you don't have any money on your books yet, um, I'm going to share some of my canteen with you. Um, sadly, the reality of what we hear from staff in the institution is to say, you know what, nothing is ever free in prison or in detention. So to always look for what is the ulterior motive um, of, of those behaviors of, you know, I shared my canteen with you and now I expect something in return uh, can, can be a pretty dangerous or a pretty... Um, situation that could lead to further abuse. Some of the things when we talk about um, 
some red flags when we talk to correctional staff that we really want them to be looking for um, in perpetrator behavior. Uh, if they're noticing consistent verbal harassment of other inmates, like we said, with that continuum of conduct, that can be where it starts. Um, looking if they're, if you notice that they are starting to groom some potential victims. Uh, if there is blatant sexual harassment of other inmates, obviously that's a huge red flag that needs to be addressed. Uh, if they do have a prior history of perpetrating sexual abuse, as we had said earlier that it's not always sex offenders, but that can definitely be a red flag for a risk of abusiveness. Uh, possibly if they had their own past victimization, that might be incorporated as well. Uh, if they have difficulty controlling their anger, uh, if they have poor coping strategies or skills, I'm not saying that this is always going to be if these if inmates have these characteristics that it's absolutely that they're going to be perpetrators, but these are definitely red flags that we have seen in the past that we need to look out for. Um, if there's the voyeuristic behavior, uh, if they're if they're watching other inmates shower, toilet, change, um, obviously that's a big red flag. And also if there's the exhibitionist behavior, um, if they have inmates who are intentionally masturbating in front of staff, um, who are exposing their genitals to staff or other inmates, or who are um, exhibiting other, I guess if you would refer to them as lewd and lascivious behaviors, those are very sexually aggressive behaviors and things that staff need to really be aware of um, and to address it with the perpetrator to make sure they don't have opportunities uh, to commit any kind of abuse on other inmates and also so that they can get treatment for those behaviors. Um, again, that's a huge part of the prevention issue so that we want to make sure we don't give them the opportunity um, to perpetrate a crime. Some of the things that we're going to be looking for in staff perpetrator behavior, and these are things that, um, you know, we hear from investigators who identified kind of this pattern. Um, again, if there's sexually charged comments or behaviors towards inmates, if there's um, flirting or some nonverbal signals, signals, if you see staff members who are staring at um, inmates or finding ways to gain and maintain a close proximity um, to the inmate, to have frequent contact with them, um, frequent physical contact with them. Um, if there's rule violations, if there are staff members who are giving gifts or special, special favors, e food or money, um, or if they're having contact with an inmate post-custody, those are huge, huge boundary violations that staff need to be aware of. Um, if they find that an inmate knows personal information about a staff member, that's a huge red flag. Um, and some things that staff, I know it's not easy ever to have to address some of these issues with coworkers, uh, but it's really important to, again, to work towards the prevention. Some of the things that, you, that we might not think would be uh, necessarily red flags, but we hear some of the detectives that have done PREA investigations. Um, we know some of the first things that colleagues are saying is, you know what, I noticed that a real change in her appearance. You know, her, she started uh, wearing more makeup and she started, you know, her uniform just looked a little crisper or, you know, her professional, maybe she's non-uniform staff, she just started dressing nicer. Um, wearing, you know, I noticed that the officer started wearing cologne. Um, he really maintained his, his beard was real shaven, um, differently groomed. Just difference that they're knowing in their personal appearance. Um, maybe they're bringing in contraband for the inmate, whether or not that be food or uh, a cell phone. Um, obviously, again, we're talking about safety and security issues. If that staff member's creating opportunities to be alone with an inmate, if you notice that, again, they have a familiarity with an inmate that goes above and beyond what their professional duties would require, um, if they're taking extra interest in unpopular inmates, uh, isolating, if, if that staff member is isolated from other employees, that's a huge red flag. Um, if you see they're overly concerned, again, above and beyond their professional responsibilities, but a particular inmate, and certainly if they cannot account for their time, um, those are some big red flags. Sharing some information again, I know a lot of people have direct victim service experience and expertise on here, so a lot of this is going to be um, very familiar to you because like I said, there's victims that how they react and how they are affected in the community, that traumatization is really going to mirror uh, with victims in detention. You may find victims who are very expressive and who can share um, 
a lot of details about their feelings and about their assault and you may have some who are more controlled um, and and don't express it as easily you may find people who have some an uh, atypical response that you're not expecting they may be giggling or they may have a real flat affect or they may just be very confused um, broad spectrum of emotions just as in the community you're going to see victims who feel that guilt and shame that we talked about earlier um, who may be in denial that it even happened at all they may be um, fearful have anger be embarrassed um, uh, may have anxiety about it, may be expressing some suicidal ideations. What is important um, for us to know and for correctional staff to know that those emotions may not be stable and they may fluctuate, but also absolutely there is no right or wrong way for a victim to react. However that individual victim reacts is completely normal and uh, needs to be supportive in the way that's most uh, beneficial for them. Again, emotional, uh, the reactions may come um, manifest as depression, social withdrawal, some fear, anger, and aggression. As in the community, that complex nature of consent can lead to self-blame. But like we talked about before, definitely compliance does not equal consent. Um, so for victims to understand that, if you are working with an inmate victim, to help them understand that just because they may um, have complied with the assault or the abuse for whatever reason, certainly that does not indicate their consent and does not give them um, any reason to feel shame or blame or guilt about, about what happened. Um, also really important to recognize that in the detention environment, sharing or talking about their feelings may be a safety risk for an inmate. Um, so for them to see an advocate coming in to work with them, possibly uh, law enforcement coming in to work with them, if they can see you as somebody um, you know, that they can trust and express uh, what they're going through, that is a really important thing. For security staff, you know, we talk about um, with corrections to recognize that somebody who's experienced some form of trauma, that their feelings of disorientation, confusion, and anxiety may make it difficult for them to follow the rules. And for staff to really explore what is going on with an inmate instead of just giving them disciplinary tickets for having those issues is not going to get them anywhere. Um, but really finding out where the root of their trauma is. Um, could really help them out. One of the things the standards really specify, you know, they want to make sure that if somebody does disclose that they can separate the abuser and the inmate because inmates are in close proximity to their offender, whether that is another staff, whether it's a staff member or another inmate. Um, but it's really important to say, you know what, you can't just take that inmate victim and toss them into segregation to make sure that they're safe because that isolation immediately might be a relief, but it could also cause further trauma. So we always want to be recognizing what is best for that particular inmate. For advocates to be aware, you know, especially when they're processing ways for um, victims, inmate victims to, um, you know, do some grounding work or some healing work to recognize that they have a tremendous lack of control over their environment. Um, they are told where they can go, when they can go, how they should go there, um, so their movement, um, the personal effects that they're allowed to have, their personal space, they really have very little control over that. So helping them process their healing within the confines um, of detention can be challenging. Um, there are some different issues when we look at the gender responsivity issue and there you know female victims again like I said I think parallels the community um, but in corrections we hear from female victims that talk about you know their lack of a right to privacy to room searches um, and especially to bodily searches may replicate past abuse um, may definitely be a trigger for them um, so that's really really important to be able to to recognize and to address with them um, female victims, inmates especially, we hear talk about, uh, you know, their concern with how reporting may interrupt their relationships with their family, with their friends, with people on the outside, whether that be with phone calls uh, or their visits. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, the um, survivor Jan, when she talks about, you know, she was afraid that reporting her assaults, which to her were happening daily for months. Um, she was terrified to report because she was worried that was going to affect her release date. Um, 
in other aspects, victims may be worried that, um, you know, if they get a major conduct report, that might change their custody classification, that might change the institution that they're at, um, and that's just a whole upheaval that many victims are afraid um, to make a report or decide not to report because of those issues. Uh, female victims may not understand that it's possible to refuse, especially if they have had a past history of abuse. Um, they may lack the perception that they have a right to refuse. That's one of the things that we want to make sure that we educate inmates in every facility coming in is so they understand that they have a right to be free um, from any kind of sexual abuse or sexual harassment um, and to tell them how they can, re how they can report. Um, and again, like we talked about, some may believe that it's always dangerous to refuse, so they may comply um, with the assault that's being perpetrated on them. For male victims, um, you know, some of the things that we hear reported from male victims is that, um, you know, they feel an incredible amount of shame and denial. Um, possibly they felt that they were unheard or unrecognized as an abuse victim, and that might not just be how they feel, that might be the truth. They may not have been identified. Um, they may guard their feelings to mask vulnerability um, because they are acutely aware of the code of, of inmate conduct and kind of their ranking inside. They feel that maybe if they uh, express their feelings or if they report themselves uh, as a victim that they may be seen as uh, homosexual and that may make them more vulnerable to other inmates. But what I think is important also again to understand and to recognize back to those dynamics that when we're talking about male on male assault in institutions as in the community we're not necessarily talking about a perpetrator or a victim who identifies as gay it's very often heterosexual victim and heterosexual perpetrator because again it's about that power and control it's about that domination it's about that fear the threats um, getting their needs met through those very abusive behaviors but again, for male survivors, that is um, definitely something that might prevent them um, from coming forward and, and identifying. So we want correctional staff to be aware of, again, if we can't prevent it, we want to be able to detect and respond as soon as possible. So we want staff to be aware of changes in inmate behavior. Uh, inmates in the past who haven't been a problem but are now acting out uh, may have experienced some form of trauma, and they may be intentionally acting out to get removed from their current space. Uh, if their, their cellmate or their celly uh, is the one who is abusing them, it may not be safe. They may not have the opportunity to come right out to correctional staff and say, this is what's happening to me. So they may intentionally, um, you know, break a rule violation to get re removed from that cell to a place where they're safe. Um, Similarly, any deviation from routine behavior or activity should spark the conversation um, just to check in with that inmate to see what's going on. If there's a sudden drop in participation in their activities or programs, certainly, absolutely, if they are um, indicating self-abusive behaviors or suicidal behaviors, uh, if they're starting to see increased requests to speak with medical personnel, or suddenly if they're having a refusal to shower, eat, or be in certain uh, less supervised areas. Those are definitely things that, um, that staff are going to want to be aware of. So some things that we talked about, what correctional staff need to be aware of, but just some, I guess, practical, kind of logistical things that advocates need to be aware of. Um, and one of the main things that advocates really need to understand um, is that while your response and the services you provide to a victim, whether or not you're an advocate with a sexual assault service provider, perhaps you're a victim witness coordinator that's working with an inmate victim on a case that's coming through, the services that you provide um, for their victimization issues are going to be the same as you would with somebody in the community. But recognizing that there, if you are responding to a prison, a county jail, um, some kind of detention facilities, there are going to be security procedures you need to be aware of. Um, and one of the first things that you need to recognize that I, as an advocate um, coming to corrections, took me a while to really understand um, is that facility operations will supersede advocacy service provision or any other external appointments. Um, and that's just not logistically as far as appointments, but just in concept to recognize that the safety and security of an institution 
of the institution population of the institution staff is first and foremost. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But to be aware of the facility operations, um, to check and talk, you know, it's so important to build relationships with the detention facility that you're working with so that before you come to work with an inmate, you're aware of some really um, pretty big issues. You're going to want to know, will that inmate victim be in restraints when they come to meet with you, or are they going to be accompanied by a correctional officer? Um, when you come to meet with that victim, are you going to meet with them face-to-face, -face, or are you going to have to talk to them, um, you know, through a glass partition over telephones? What is, what is the facility, um, you know, set up? What are your options for, um, where you're going to meet with that person, is it going to be in a conference room, you know, to kind of get some of those logistics straightened out prior to responding. Um, you're going to want to know how long it's going to take you to get through security. Um, what are some items that you're allowed to, to bring into the facility? Is there a dress code that you need to abide by? Um, you're going to want to know, are you going to have to go through a metal detector? Um, all those kind of things that you really want to know for the facilities in your service area. What are the requirements? Um, you're going to want to know for inmates who might need to be transported outside of the facility, what does that look like? Um, you know, for an inmate who may need to be transported for a SANE exam or some kind of medical treatment, advocates need to recognize and be prepared for the fact that victim is probably, that inmate victim is going to be brought in in restraints. Um, and they will be escorted by a correctional officer who, you know, most likely will be present during that SANE exam. Um, Certainly that accompaniment is, is not meant to uh, embarrass or humiliate the inmate victim, but it's necessary to ensure the custody of the inmate as well as the safety of the medical staff and the advocate uh, who are in the room. What's really important, again, is to be prepared for this ahead of time, to, um, to discuss this with your local SANE staff. You know, obviously the SANE ultimately is in control of what happens in their exam room, so they need to be prepared as well, but have that conversation of, um, you know, is it, is the, uh, how are people going to be positioned in the room? How is the inmate going to be restrained while still being empowering and supportive and getting them the treatment that they need? Um, Talk to security staff about, you know, if you're in the institution, when we talk about that first bullet about facility operations, um, what happens when, you know, you're there at 11 o'clock and the institution uh, does their count and they, you know, everything stops in the institution so they can do a count to make sure that every inmate is present and accounted for. What happens if you're in the institution when that happens? Um, what happens if you're in the institution when for some security reason the institution goes on lockdown? Um, you know, those are kind of things that you want to have that conversation um, before you're there and it happens and you're prepared. Uh, check with the facility to see if they offer training for volunteers, you know, that your advocates uh, could go through so that you can learn more about um, the security procedures. Um, advocates definitely, you know, and I think advocates probably do this really well because we're used to working with SART teams in the community, where we're used to working with uh, multiple disciplines, but it's really important for advocates and other community professionals, as well as correctional professionals, um, to understand the role that everybody fulfills and uh, the reasons for maybe some of the differences um, in those roles. Uh, I think if you look at advocates, you know, we look at advocates and our, our role is to, you know, to provide services and, and the services that we provide include trusting the experience that the advocate, or excuse me, the inmate victim is reporting to us. Um, to empower them in their healing and, and, and to be supportive of their self-determined decisions. Um, as you can imagine, that might be in some stark contrast to what a corrections security officer, um, what their role is. Their role is for the custody, maintain the secure care and custody of that inmate, um, as well as the safety of every person in the institution. And again, that includes an advocate coming in to provide services. So those can kind of be in a little bit of a conflict, but to understand, again, the role that everybody plays and um, why it's so important is huge. Um, so one of the things that I'll probably, you know, I think I've mentioned once or twice, and I probably will mention once or twice again because it is so important, is right now reach out, establish um, 
you know, reach out to the corrections professionals in your community, or if you are with a corrections agency, reach out to your advocates in your community, reach out to the SANE nurses, to local law enforcement. Establish that cooperation and mutual respect with each other from the beginning, um, and that collaboration is definitely greatly going to enhance everybody's work um, that's going to ultimately benefit um, the victim that we're trying to trying to serve. Uh, if you don't have a SART team in your community or if uh, you know maybe look at getting a SART team put together. If you do have a SART maybe look at um, incorporating a PREA aspect to that so again everybody knows um, you know what their roles and responsibilities are. For working with an inmate victim, again, there are really just some basic things that you are already out there doing and providing to the survivors in your community that you're just going to want to take and, and translate to the, to the inmate victim. Um, you can teach them grounding skills such as deep breathing, journaling, um, certain physical exercise that they can do within the limits of, of um, their current situation. You can listen and validate their experience. Um, if pre-approved from the facility, you can provide them with some outside reference materials um, and definitely I think it's important to um, you know connect with other advocates who are out there and responding to um, to inmate victims for support and to for some guidance and some some ideas um, of things that they find helpful when they work with inmate victims um, some of the things that's important to realize of what an advocate cannot do um, that is absolutely huge as much as you want to help somebody um, you cannot there's some really important boundaries and limitations that you have to set with an inmate victim. Um, you know, there is no physical contact of any kind that is allowed, um, as well as sharing any of your personal information. Certainly you're going to share, you know, your name and the program that you're with, but it really needs to stop there. Um, and again, that's just maintaining that professional boundary. Um, and that's the same that correctional staff would do with the inmates as well. Um, you cannot contact others on behalf of the inmate, even if they, you know, they may tell you, I really want, you know, I want you to, to let my, my family or my friends know that I'm doing okay. Please let them know that this happened to me and please, um, you know, give them an update on this. You cannot, you cannot do that um, because you don't know, um, you know, there may be no contacts in place with people. Um, their family and friends may have been uh, victims by their crimes. Um, anything like that that's presented, you're going to want to discuss uh, with correctional staff to see, let them know that a, a request was presented and see how um, they want you to respond. Absolutely bringing in any kind of food, toiletries, or other contraband for the inmate um, is also very strictly um, prohibited. Also, just to keep in mind, um, there may be some logistical challenges for advocates in maintaining confidentiality. Um, to remember that if you are speaking with an inmate over the phone, um, number one, ask that inmate victim if anybody else is in the room. Um, certainly, if there's a, a correctional staff member in the room um, overhearing the conversation, that might be of concern. Um, so you're going to want to discuss um, you know, the limit on where where privilege or confidentiality falls within that. Uh, phone calls out of most uh, detention facilities are recorded, so I think that's important to be aware of. Um, and then depending on the security classification of an inmate victim, uh, it may not be possible for you to meet with them alone if you're responding to an institution. So again, to um, know how you're going to handle that and know how you're going to address that. I think it's very important. I think a lot of uh, programs are probably doing this with um, survivors in the community when they look at informed consent issues. Uh, it's really very important that you're clear with the inmate victim on the limits of the confidentiality again. We want to preserve it as much as possible, um, but there are going to be times when the advocate may be required or permitted to break confidentiality. And I think um, most of those probably look pretty familiar as you would in the community if the inmate victim reports a plan to hurt themselves or kill themselves. Um, if they report that a child is in danger or um, a vulnerable adult who's in danger, certainly if a program receives a subpoena or court order. But what's different about um, um, the institution environment is if that inmate victim reports an escape plan um, or relays other information that may jeopardize the safety and security of the institution, again, that's something that's going to need to be reported to correctional staff. Um, you know, so everybody's on the same page with that. We really, really encourage uh, programs to establish an MOU 
with the facility so that everybody is on the same page uh, with how they will respond and how they will participate and what they will services that they will provide and to possibly have like I said an in, um, informed consent agreement with the inmate victim so that they are aware of that um, right up hand. The PREA standards, um, I know I have been rambling long and I know we're getting uh, close to time here that I want to allow some um, time for questions. So what I'm just going to kind of flip through here a little bit, the standards are available that you, if you just kind of do a, a Google search of the PREA standards and find them and read through them, um, you know, they're really not that long. They're about 20 pages long. Um, I think you would find them very interesting and informative. Um, for the advocates uh, listening, I think the reporting requirement uh, will be of most interest to you as it does have a provision that requires offender access to outside confidential support services. So again, you're going to want to let the detention facilities in your community know that you're out there, know about the services that you have to provide, uh, and know about what your uh, role in responding to an inmate victim would be. Um, so again, I'm just going to flip through these a little bit and get to the kind of a little bit of a wrap-up point um, in recognizing that I think is so important for us all um, to understand ourselves, but also to educate our communities on, and that is the, you know, the core fact that inmates have the right to be free from sexual abuse, sexual harassment, and staff sexual misconduct. Um, regardless of the crimes that they may have committed, individuals in detention have equal rights to safety, dignity and justice and administrators of confinement facilities um, you know really have a duty to uphold those rights and um, you know as a community as advocates as corrections professionals as um, you know sexual assault nurse examiners law enforcement um, if we are going to say that it is, sexual abuse is never okay never ever ever okay we have to maintain that belief for every victim and that might include victims who have committed crimes of their own um, and who may be kind of hard to accept as a victim but we need to be steadfast in that and we need to recognize that um, when somebody is put in a confinement facility we have an absolute responsibility to keep that person safe um, one of the most profound things that I think I've heard kind of explain to that is to say you know regardless of a crime that somebody's committed no um, no defendant has ever been sentenced to 10 years and three sexual assaults. It is not an inevitable consequence of incarceration. It is not an acceptable consequence of incarceration. And it has a huge consequence and a huge cost to our communities if we don't address it. Certainly we do not want any more victims created. We do not want people leaving a detention facility worse than when they came in. Um, the impaired reentry success, the recidivism rate, and just the diminished confidence in the correction system, um, you know, are also factors that that play in. Um, so recognizing that sexual safety is safety and security for staff, for offenders, and ultimately for our community. For people who aren't aware of um, kind of reentry dynamics within the Wisconsin Department of Corrections, 95 to 97 percent of our inmates will return to the community. Um, certainly with county jails, they are holding people who are serving sentences less than a year. So their populations most likely are returning, and if, unless they're coming to DOC, they're returning to your community. And certainly we don't want to send somebody back to community um, who has been traumatized in the institution. Some really important resources that I want people to be aware of. Um, the National Pre Resource Center has some excellent information um, and has some um, really good resources. I would encourage people to go, if you haven't already, to the PREA Resource Center and sign up for their action alerts. They have great webinars that are available and their webinars are archived that you can find a lot of good information. Just Detention International has some fantastic information and specifically Just Detention has uh, manuals for advocates um, that offer some really good um, information uh, for advocates, as is the um, Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape, um, that if you Google search them, they certainly have some great information. Um, Washington Colleges of Law Project Addressing Prison Rape, we are um, very fortunate to have a close relationship with a phenomenal um, woman named Jamie Yarusi, who is the grant coach for the grant that I work on, um, has, some, has some great information. Um, so I would encourage you to check any of those resources. 
Um, one of the things that I also really want to point out for the grant that I work on is a, a local juvenile and tribal demonstration grant um, with the five communities um, that you see on the screen there. One of the things that we did with our grant is we developed a curriculum to train their staff members on PREA. And one of the things that we have been messaging um, and really emphasizing is that portion where they talk about, where we talk about um, um, inmate and vict victim dynamics is we have encouraged them to reach out to their local staffs and ask them to help cross train their staff on victim dynamics and victim responses. So um, we are messaging that tremendously. So we're hoping um, that you will get a call from a local facility that says we're trying to train our staff and please come partner and cross train with us. Um, Dodge County and Fond du Lac County currently have Priya SARS that are up and running. Um, we can certainly get you more information or connect if you're looking to develop a Priya SART in your community. Um, I know I'm kind of flying through things here at the end. I want to have everybody um, to have my contact information so that if you are interested in receiving a copy of the PowerPoint, um, if you would like a link um, to the uh, YouTube video about the survivor testimony, and then also I have those um, uh, that I can just send to you. Instead of having to have you search on your own the, the advocacy resource documents um, through Just Attention and PCAR as well. So. I think there are a few questions that we're going to look at to see um, and see how good my eyes hold up across the room to give. Um. So one of the questions um, is that we thought those who were incarcerated could not give consent. Um, and that is true. And I think that is, I, I apologize if I misspoke. Um, on that at some point, but I think one of the, um, you know, the pop quiz questions that we looked at was the true or false inmates um, can give consent to, um, that it's okay for inmates, um, for staff to have contact with inmates as long as they consent. And the reason that that was false is because of that power and control dynamic, inmates cannot consent to sexual contact. Um, similar to, you know, somebody who would say, well, I had sex with a 14-year-old, but he said it was okay. Again, that comes into a consent issue that is correct. Inmates cannot consent um, to sexual contact with staff. Um, Again, inmates, uh, with inmates consenting to sexual contact between each other, um, again, that's going to be something that is going to be investigated because if both inmates come and say, yes, we, this was agreed upon consensual sexual activity, again, those um, power and control dynamics could still be at play there. So we're still going to want to investigate um, and address that as well. Um, why is it that inmate on inmate is sexual abuse but staff on inmate is sexual misconduct? If you look at the definitions in the PREA standards, there is um, kind of, I guess, a threshold of what is inmate, what is considered sexual abuse, and so what um, what has to rise to the level to be considered sexual abuse, what kind of behavior that needs to be. Um, there may be some behavior that doesn't quite rise to the level of sexual abuse but might be um, a rule violation that's going to be addressed. Um, so there's kind of, I guess, if you will, um, different degrees uh, with inmates that they would have to look at. Why it's called misconduct with staff is because it doesn't matter on the degree any kind of sexual contact, whether it be um, you know, if you look at sexual abuse, kissing is probably not going to be considered a sexual abuse thing if you look in that between inmates. Kissing for staff members, that's going to be something to look at because that's the kind of sexual behavior, maybe not kissing is the best example, but any kind of sexual contact is going to be staff sexual misconduct, is going to be criminal misconduct, and that's why it's addressed um, that way. Um, one question, uh, you talk about getting the inmate help if they are displaying red flag behavior. So what type of help are you referring to? So some of those, um, you know, and red flag behaviors, if we're talking about somebody who is starting to groom potential victims, if we're talking about somebody who's displaying um, voyeuristic 
behaviors or the exhibitionist behaviors. They're going to need to be uh, evaluated and assessed by psychological services and perhaps um, you know this will incorporate some of their past offenses that maybe they're appropriate for sex offender treatment. Um, maybe they have a mental health issue that needs to be addressed. It really isn't um, kind of a cookie cutter um, treatment, it would be something that would have to be evaluated um, by psychological services to see why, what are the underlying causes that um, this person is, is uh, displaying these behaviors and what kind of treatment do they need. So um, they would probably, like I said, look at if there's a mental health issue, if there's anger management issues, if there's sex offender issues, um, and those would, would be looked at. Um, you know, I think one of the things, um, another question that came in uh, is recognizing that there may be some fear in working with inmate victims, um, and what can we do as advocates to be as safe as possible while working with the inmate victims, um, and what can we do to increase our comfort level? Um, that's an excellent question, and I think one of the things, again, for the safety issue is to build those relationships with security staff in your community so that you understand um, what is what it's going to be like for you responding to a facility, what it's going to be like to be in that facility, um, who do you go to with questions, um, you know, recognizing that security staff is there to keep you safe while you are there. Um, to increase your comfort level, I think just learning more about it, any chance you have the opportunity to learn more about the dynamics of PREA, um, about the institutions that you're going to be responding to, um, I think that's key, but I also think it's key to find people in your own agency to debrief with, to find the resources here with the experts at WACASA, to have the conversations, to you know, continue to maybe keep this um, at the forefront of recognizing that the more we talk about it, the more we hone our response the better teams that we build within our communities is that we're going to start to see more of an increase in reporting. Um, we're going to start to see confidence from the correction system in understanding why advocates are so valuable to the process. You're going to start to get the calls. You're going to start to, um, you know, do some outreach. And I think the more we have the conversations, um, the more comfort that people are going to see, the more we start to um, identify uh, advocates who maybe have more experience that we can point people in the right direction, uh, I think is going to be huge. So I think you've all taken an amazing first step, or maybe this is your third or fourth step, um, but participating in the conversation um, is essential. So I really encourage people to get out there and start building your teams and start talking with your uh, community partners. Um, about what you can do about PREA and how you can really um, continue to make a difference. Um, I recognize, you know, in, in programs, I recognize capacity issues are a huge kind of thing. So again, having the conversation, you know, we had one of our institutions up in the northern part of the state called me and said, Keely, you know, I really, I'm, I really want to work with our advocacy program, but they're three counties over and, um, you know, they don't know if they can respond and I don't know. Um, I don't want them to drive all the way over here and then, they, then you know, something happens. Or So maybe you talk about ways that you can have access to, uh, inmate has access to an advocate over the phone. Or, um, you know, maybe you say, wow, I only have an hour to meet with this person, but if I have to drive to the institution and go through security, and then uh, I have to wait for them to be brought to the cell, we're talking two or three hours. Well, maybe you can make an arrangement to go to your local um, probation and parole office and, um, you know, dial into the institution via a webcam. Um, you know, that maybe that's a different um, option that saves time, um, saves the hassle of going through security and responding to an institution, uh, physically safe um, safety concerns for the inmate might be, or for the advocate, excuse me, might be alleviated. Um, confidentiality concerns might be alleviated if you can say, you know what, put that inmate in the room where they're on cam and I'm in another cam, and maybe there's no need for a correctional officer to be there. You know, those are all things that we can help process, um, like I said, if we bring issues forth to respond as a team. So um, I really just, like I said, want to thank WACASA staff for this opportunity today and everybody who participated. Um, please, if you have additional questions, uh, my email and contact information is there. If you would like, again, a copy of the PowerPoint or other resources that we have available or you just have other questions, um, we'd be happy to talk to you about that and certainly would refer you to the, 
to wonderful resources here at WACASA as well. So um, I think with that, I will um, uh, we'll be signing off here and hope everybody has a wonderful, safe day. And um, thank you for all the work out there that you're doing with um, not only during Sexual Assault Awareness Month, but um, everything you're doing to serve your communities throughout the years. So have a wonderful day. Thank you.